John Sylvester. John uh, began his decorated career as a crime reporter in 1979. As he recently wrote, we type stories on real typewriters, filed our reports over the phone to copy takers who could type a million cliches a minute, and we thought polyester shirts with alarmingly large collars were the height of fashion. In the decade since, John has reported on Melbourne's seedy underbelly, reporting on gangsters, on cops, straight and crooked. He has rubbed shoulders with the likes of Mick Gatto, Carl Williams and Chopper Reed, with his wickedly funny writing style pricking the most pompous of criminal egos. John is the co-author with another celebrated Melbourne journalist, Andrew Rule, of the Underbelly series of books, which of course have been turned into really terrific TV shows. And his Naked City in the column, the column in the Age every Saturday morning is essential reading. In fact, it's one of the first things I, I read every Saturday, John. In his 40 years as a journalist, John has worked with editors who he says, 15 editors rather, over 40 years, who he says have ranged from inspirational to insane. Perhaps we'll hear more about that. He has won three Walkleys, seven Quills, and in 2007 was named the Graham Perkin Australian Journalist of the Year. He is very much a media legend in his own, own right. And ladies and gentlemen, as we welcome John Sylvester, here's a blast from our black and white past. Listen to me. Print that story, you're a dead man. It's not just me anymore. You'd have to stop every newspaper in the country now, and you're not big enough for that job. People like you've tried it before, with bullets, prison, censorship. But as long as even one newspaper will print the truth, you're finished. Don't give me that fancy double talk. I'll answer. Yes or no? Yes or no? Hey! Hutchison? That noise, what's that racket? That's the press, baby. The press. And there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing. John Sylvester. Uh, that movie's Deadline USA, which was made in 1952, um, it was about a campaigning editor and his brave staff who wrote brilliant stories while their knucklehead proprietors were trying to sell it from under them. Um, I wonder why it's relevant now. <laughs> in fact, that newspaper was basically the one I joined with typewriters and printing presses and ink and compositors. And nothing had really changed from then. Uh, the language today is different to what it was then. We spoke of the big one, which was page one, a smoky, which was an exclusive, and the fudge was the little box on the back where you'd put the late breaking news. Certainly language in newspapers has changed. Back then, high tech really was about your education. You either went to a high or a tech. Rebooting was done by a cobbler. A tinder was the state of the bush um, during the fire season. And a dick pic was basically a mugshot of an SKP you got from the consorting squad. <laughs> but things move on. We had a deadline at 10.30 at night. We had full staff. Um, I remember the first day I walked in, I said to my editor, John Morgan, where's my office? And he laughed. <laughs> 19 editors later, I asked Alex Lavelle the other day, where's my office? And he laughed. So while things change, some things stay the same. We were the kings of the media. We were the ones that um, the leaders spoke to. It wasn't managed in the way it is now. A media release was basically flatulence inside a press conference. <laughs> Think about it for a moment. Thank you very much. 
We did it a lot well. Uh, we published in the day what had happened the day before, but there were areas that perhaps looking back on, we weren't that good. Indigenous affairs, family violence, mental illness, areas like um, police corruption. It took one of the legends, Evan Witten, at the Truth newspaper to expose members of the Homicide Squad as taking bribes uh, from abortionists. It wasn't actually the mainstream media that did it. Sometimes I look back at some of the stories I've, I've written and, and you look, and on page three, um, we wouldn't say bum in the paper, but on page three would be a picture of a girl. And it could be, um, you know, here's Jackie 17 on holidays at Mount Martha uh, in a bikini. It didn't date all that well when you think of it now. But um, I went to um, police rounds where I spent most of my time, and it was amazing how many um, big names went through there. Andrew, Andrew Bolt, for example, just a callow youth. Who would have thought he'd become a leviathan? I remember one of his um, early jobs, he had to go to a kidnapping in the country and he was so keen, he drove very fast, as we all did, but he um, actually had a head-on with a police car. <laughs> Even then he found it very difficult to veer to the left. Police rounds was a male-dominated area, which was really stupid because the best police reporter in the world was N.W. Cannon at the Miami Herald. And um, we, were learnt, we, we saw a lesson in this because in Sydney, certainly, where the big, tough male police reporters were complicit with the corrupt police at the time, it was Marion Wilkinson and Wendy Bacon from the National Times who did the real grunt work to expose that. You had to live through it to understand what the New South Wales police were like. Sometimes their detectives would come down, drink at the City Court Hotel. It's the first time I ever saw a Xenia suit, actually. Um, and when they occasionally paid for a drink, it still had the bank die from the security on the $20 notes. I blundered into that world um, when I was given a transcript of some illegally tapped telephones, which later became the age tapes. And within it, it was clear that a fairly well-known detective in New South Wales had warned um, the gangster Bob Tremboli that he should leave the country before the Stuart Royal Commission could interview him. So I wrote the story, but being really clever, I gave the guy a nickname. Um, sadly for me, I picked his real nickname. <laughs> so uh, that didn't work. So the, the commissioner of the day uh, had a release to suggest that I had a pathological hatred of New South Wales Police. The Minister made a statement in the House saying that I was lying. That didn't really worry me, but did, what did worry me is I got a phone call, and it was from someone who didn't even introduce themselves. They just said, I know who you're talking about. He will kill you stone dead. That particularly worried me because it was the director of the Australian Bureau of Criminal Intelligence, <laughs> who was also my father. <laughs> so the next call, uh, was from the Stuart Royal Commission and they said you've got to come up and give evidence. Stupidly I went up under my own name and I was terrified. I was I expected Roger Rogerson to be dressed as a porter but I got out and I hopped in a cab and we hadn't gone two miles when he pulled over and said I want you to wait by that pole over there. I thought that's it so I grabbed him in a headlock and wouldn't let him go which surprised him because he had dodgy brakes and he was trying to call me another cab. But over the journey, I've actually worked with some of the legends um, who've already been inducted. I think of the great Terry Phelan, the photographer, brave as God, and we went to you know, what was called then an intrusion. And um, I asked about three stupid questions, got two quotes, and was putting the notebook away when he went very gently start to ask questions. And he was the one who got the story. And he showed me that empathy never goes out of style. I think of Les Carline, if there's a greater all-round journalist, I haven't seen him, who from a sub-editor, inspirational editor, feature writer, historian, if there was one writer to tell young journalists to read, it's Les. Uh, I think of Michael Sheehan, who showed that you can work in one area of journalism and not become prisoner to your sources. He always made me laugh because of his top 50, that um, you know, people would ring up with voices quavering, with anger, 
why I wasn't Cyril Rioli number three. I could call someone a murderer, no one cared. But Michael had to go into witness protection. <laughs> Caroline Wilson, she had this great curiosity and a great nose for news. Sort of reporter who could go into the morgue and get a story. <laughs> and three quotes as well. <laughs> and Andrew Rule, um, who I've had a long and fantastic relationship with, a bloke who can write a serious book about a horse or a funny story about a bookie. I read his CV on the, uh, the sleeve of his latest book and obviously uh, because of lack of space there was one omission of course was that he and I were involved in writing the Chopper Reed books um, which of course was grievous bodily harm on the English language but um, that actually began because um, I wrote a fairly savage story about Mark and he sent me a Christmas card uh, which surprised me because it was June and in it it said, um, I hope the yuletide log falls from your fireplace and burns your house down. <laughs> a perfect Christmas for me would be to own a thousand room hotel and find a dead Herald Sun reporter behind every door. <laughs> Seasons, greetings and jingle bells. <laughs> now I thought I was pretty special to get a, a, a Christmas card from Mark, but I found out he'd done it to other people including Justice Frank Vincent of the Parole Board and the one he sent him had a nativity scene on the cover with Jesus loves you and inside Mark had written but personally I think you're an asshole. <laughs> but we were, uh, Andrew and I were uh, ahead of our time because we believed in media cooperation which is why secretly late at night we inputted the Chopper Reed book on the Herald and Weekly Times computer system and took it out on giant disks and on a Sunday when no one was there went to a Fairfax Suburban was let in where we laid the book out. Some people would call that um, burglary and theft by deception. I prefer to call it cooperation. <laughs> and we now see that Fairfax and News are going to do exactly that. So we were well, well ahead of our time. So we went through those great days and then of course the internet hit and um, I think it's fair to say we panicked. Um, what we tried to do was follow the trend, follow our way into social media and I think we forgot our core. We were a little bit like the drunken uncle at a wedding. He decides to get up and rap to show how groovy he is. <laughs> I think of Frank Sinatra who was the king of the bobby socks and then that rock and roll came along. So he tried to change. He started wearing loud shirts and bling and singing songs about being groovy. It stunk. Then he realised, do what you're good at. So he put a tuxedo on and he sang My Way. People like that. My way, our way. That's what we've got to do. We've got to do it our way. And I think that's happening. I think we're going back to that. Look at the New York Times and the Washington Post in these days of fake news. They're coming back. What made us were those printing presses, but what became a sea anchor were those printing presses. Today, with the internet, we only stop by our own imaginations, get the capacity to get the story. We can now blog, we can podcast, we can put it in hard print or we can drop it at any time. Just think, um, look, we've lost, um, you know, it's ridiculous to suggest that we are what we were. We're much smaller and we've lost some tremendous voices. As I said, I work in an open plan um, office and the desk and the chair sitting opposite me is always empty and that was Michael Gordon's, who we miss. But just think of what happened last week, one block away, Burke Street. Just think how that was covered, how through social media, through citizen journalism, we saw what happened, how quickly the Herald Sun and the Age were able to get a real story and get it in the paper, online. Let me tell you that in my day, back then, we would have run to the scene, we would have been kept away, we would have got some grainy black and white pictures 
of a burnt out truck, we would have never found Trolley Man and we would have had to rely on the police version of why they used fatal force. The next day we would have had a big debate on whether they should or shouldn't have shot him. That debate didn't happen because everyone was able to see it. A perfect example of mainstream media and citizen journalism coming together. That is the future. We talk about the old days, but let me tell you that when I, in my friggin' open planned office, looks around <laughs> and see the staff, uh, I am extremely buoyant and extremely proud. It's a new dawn. The AGES investigative team is the best in the country and the best the country has ever seen. Adele Ferguson has made business relevant. Mark Butler at the Herald Sun is as good a crime reporter as I've seen in 25 years. Mark Knight um, makes people laugh and think every day. The Australian is exploring podcasts. We are doing so much, so well, with so much less. But the one thing from that movie that still sticks is that when it comes to the terrorists, the people who do us harm, or the greedy, or the corrupt, or the bullies, then you know what? Humphrey Bogart was right. It's the press's baby, and there's nothing you can do about it. Thank you. <laughs>